I hope you brought your energy today because first service was, they were on fire today. They were ready to go. They woke up early and they had their energy. So I'm hoping you've got the same energy today because here's the thing. We're in week number two of no regrets. Listen, you have to understand we're not asking and we're not hoping that we live a perfect life this next year. See, God gives us a word as a church every year. God gives me a word for our church every year. And and our word this year is no regrets. And here's the thing. We're not looking to live perfect lives. We're looking to live intentional lives. We're looking to be in every moment. We're looking to take captive every thought, every action, every word. And really to live life with intentionality, with no regrets, being present in every moment of every situation, of everything that we're doing. And so that's what we're going after. Our uh, verse for the year is Ephesians 3, 20, and it says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or even imagine according to the power at work that is within us. There's something stirring inside of us. There's something working inside of us. But there's a lid, and that lid for the work of the Spirit of God in our life is you and me. And so what we want to do over this next year is really expand that capacity. We want to raise that level, raise that lid of God working in our life. And so we're in week number two of this No Regrets series. And I'm really excited because today we are talking about passion. Come on, somebody. That's not passion. Come on. When we talk about passion, there is a burning sensation inside of you. Passion, when you look it up, means this. Strong and barely controllable emotion. Passion means this. You put your energy towards something. Passion is this. It's ambition that materializes into action. And so when I say passion, what is it that comes to your mind? Man, when I say passion, I, I, I really think, I, I think about sports. When I say passion, I, I, I think back to my days when I was a youth pastor. Before we started the church, I was a youth pastor. And uh, I, I love sports, and so I love basketball. And so one of the things that I started um, was right after service on Wednesday nights, we would start playing basketball together. And so I would get the youth there, and we would get in there, and we had about 20 guys that would show up, and they would play, and we would play for a couple hours on Wednesday nights and just have a blast. But part of the thing was they were students, and part of the thing with that students is their passion sometimes um, would show up And sometimes their physical play, and they might begin pushing each other. You know, they might begin saying some words that maybe they shouldn't say. And that passion would come out of them as they're playing this game because they so desperately wanted to win. And so there was a men's league that opened up that we had the ability to get in. And so I was like, man, this would be a great opportunity. But I was honestly, I was a little nervous because as we were getting in this men's league, I was like, oh, it's a, it's a church men's league. I mean, some of the times these guys, man, I mean, they'll, they'll fight at the drop of a hat. They might say something that not everybody's used to hearing. We're working on them, helping them become more like Jesus. They're not perfect, but they just have some passion inside of them sometimes. And sometimes something comes out. It's that uncontrollable, well, what it says right there, the uncontrollable emotion that comes out inside of you sometimes. And so I was like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to do this. So we ended up playing the season, and I was like, I'm just going to work on their character, and I'm going to talk to them constantly about, man, being, playing hard, giving great effort, giving everything that you have, being competitive, but also having good character at the same time. And so I was like, this will be fantastic. So we started doing it. Man, they, they responded incredibly. We didn't have a single issue with any of them. I mean, the ref sometimes wouldn't give us the call that we should have got. You know, sometimes we might lose a game that we felt like we should have won, miss some shots. Sometimes they miss them. And, and they didn't get after each other the way that they normally do on Wednesday night. I mean, I was super impressed uh, with my leadership uh, of those kids. <laughs> but I, I, as it went on, we had the tournament. 
And the tournament came. We made it to the semifinals. We're playing in the semifinals, and it's back and forth. Man, it is a battle back and forth, and we're going back and forth. It's getting intense. We want to go to the championship. We can win this thing. Like, we're good enough to win it. And so we're battling back and forth. Well, at this tournament, through the whole season, all they had was one ref, the same ref every single week. And so we built a relationship with him. And I joke with him and give him a hard time and make comments and he'll laugh and he'll jab right back at us and give us a hard time and everything like that. And so as we're going back and forth through the whole season, man, I'll be like, man, that was a terrible call. You know, you need to go get some glasses. And he's laughing and, you know, telling me like, hey, you just need to run up and down the court faster, you know, get in a little shape and stuff. And so like we're jabbing back and forth the whole time. Well, now in the tournament, there is a new ref that we've never seen before, never met. And so we're playing, and all of a sudden, as this, the game intensifies, they go up for a shot, and I go to block it. I mean, it was clean, because I jumped, I mean, super high. And my vertical is really, really high. And so uh, I, I go up to block it, and when I do, uh, I hit him right on the elbow. I mean, I did not get high enough to block that shot. They call a foul. So I'm standing at the free throw line, and I'm like, man, that was a terrible call. Come on, open your eyes. And he just kind of looks at me, and I'm like, you got to do a better job. This is a tight game. And he looks at me, T. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, I was joking. I was like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. You're going to give me a technical right now? I was like, come on, loosen up. That's the most ridiculous. He looks at me again, and he's like, one more word. And I'm like, oh my gosh, don't challenge me like that. Of course I'm going to say something now. He's like, that was a terrible call. And he's like, T. I'm like, are you kidding me? Two technicals right now? I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm looking over. I'm yelling at the guys that are at the uh, booth that are running the game and everything. I'm like, what is this joker that you brought in here to ref this game? Are you kidding me? This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. What is he doing calling these technicals? The kids are now coming around me, putting their arms around me and going, Pastor, it's okay. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get over to the bench. And I'm walking off and I'm like, you need to get him under control. This is ridiculous. What is he doing? And everybody's looking like, like he's just standing there. You're losing your mind. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. And I'm like hitting the bench and everything. And so he looks at me again and goes, T. I get three technicals. Just like that. Never before heard of in the history of the game of basketball. Three technicals. The crazy thing was this. My wife decided to bring our kids to the first game to watch their dad play. <laughs> kids, we're going to go watch dad play. It's going to be so much fun. Like I can't wait to see him. They're sitting there as I'm going to the bench and I'm slapping the bench and I'm like, this is ridiculous. You need to be gone. You need to be gone. And he's like, you're out of here. And I'm like, I'm not out of here. Can't leave these kids. There's no clue what they'll do. <laughs> and he's like, you're gone. And I'm like, I'm not leaving. And so it escalated really quickly. And my wife like grabs the kids and their eyes are all like, and she grabs them, and she leads them out the door. She's like, okay, come on, kids. Let's go. It's time to go now. <laughs> Dad's lost his mind. Dad's gone crazy. Get in the car. We're going home. I get home. She's like, what were you doing? Like, I'm trying to teach those kids character. That's all I'm trying to do. I don't want them to respond like that. I showed them how they should not respond. But sometimes passion takes over. Sometimes passion just because there's a fire inside, there's a burning inside that sometimes the words that you say, you don't care about the response that's fixing to come. You don't care about the consequences. You've just got something to say. And so when you think about passion, I think about sports teams. Think about this. Grown men paint their face. Grown men take their shirts off and paint their bodies and stand in sporting events cheering for their team. Grown men wear shoulder pads when they're standing in the crowd, not even on the sidelines, because of their passion for a team. Grown men cheer like they are absolutely nuts. Yeah! Come on! And you can see it in their face. Grown men invest in their team. 
Listen, when you are passionate about a sporting team, you never miss an event. You plan your schedule around the time that they are going to play. You, you change wedding dates because of a game. You can't have a game on OU Texas. Are you kidding me? <laughs> There's not a chance we're having a wedding. I'm not going to that one. I have missed many of weddings because of a game. My wife's like, hey, we got a wedding. I'm like, hey, we got a game. <laughs> You'd rather watch the game than sit in a wedding. And so you will change your schedule because you're passionate about a team. Listen, you take the loss of a team to, personally. You get up the next day and you're depressed all week long. How's life going? Not good. We lost. You play? No. <laughs> You're on the team? No. You go to the game? No, I just watch them on TV. But... It's a sad day. We lost. And you are so passionate about it. Listen, you address the team as we. We're going to do better next year. <laughs> Woo, we're going to have a good year. Listen, you don't even let your kids... Wear your rival's colors. <laughs> Burn orange will never be allowed in our house. <laughs> One, just because it's ugly. But two, it's Texas. And listen, here's how much I love you, and you have to understand this. I, I love you so much that I'm willing to do things that go completely against the nature and the character of God. And so for a wedding, I was given... There was one stipulation. Hey, will you do our wedding? But we just have one thing. You have to wear the longhorns when you do the wedding. So I did. But that was their only stipulation. So I wore them upside down. But here's the thing. When you're passionate, look at politics. Look at the news now. You see faces, like you see these pictures of these people as they're trying to have a conversation and their faces are like this. <sighs> like that's not, like they're trying to talk and, and they disagree and in that disagreement there is so much hatred because they're passionate. Well, you see passion in worship. Like you look around the room and you see people and you're wondering like why are, why are their eyes closed? Why are their hands raised? Why are they on their knees? Why are they clapping? Why are they shouting? Why are they doing all these? Because of passion that's inside of them. See, what you have to understand, passion to me is this. I want you to believe and experience what I've come to know is true. Listen, I feel like I have the greatest message ever. I feel like I have the cure to the greatest disease that man has ever faced. And that disease is sin. And my passion inside of me says this. I want to stand on every street corner. I want to stand on every spot. I want to wave my hands as much as I can. And I want to say, listen, Jesus is your hope Jesus is your future. Jesus is your savior. And there's a passion inside of me every morning when I get up that I have to get this message out because I know how important it is. I know that nothing else matters. Listen, passion says this, that you may get paid to do something else, but your purpose and your calling is to let people know who Jesus is. Passion says, I'm willing to do whatever it takes in order for people to hear and know who Jesus is and have their life totally and completely transformed. I believe this, passion is contagious and passion will change lives. When you believe in something and you passionately believe in something, then everybody believes in it and everybody wants to be a part of it. And so as we look at passion, what I wanna do today is I want to look at practically how you and I implement passion into our lives. What is it that you and I do? How do you and I implement this passion? Like it's one thing to just say like, man, we need to have a fire inside of us. We need to have something inside of us that just burns, that just says, hey, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16, or 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And now we're a new creation. The old things have passed away and behold, all things have become brand new. And so there's a passion inside of us that says, listen, sin separated us from God. But here's the thing. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, we're a new creation. We're not the same person that we are. We're brand new in Jesus Christ. We have a new nature. We have a new purpose. We have a new passion to go after in our lives. 
And so what is that on a daily basis that burns inside of us? How do we live that passion out? I want to look at five things today. The first thing is this. Passion is unity. Passion is unity. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says this. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I appeal to you that this, that all of you agree and that there be no division among you. One of the greatest weapons that the enemy uses is dividing the church. Dividing the church in thinking that we, as a body of believers, are competing against each other rather than working together in order to accomplish what God has accomplished us to do. And so one of the greatest things that the enemy is like, think about this, as believers, if the, if the church came together as one, and if we started working together, think of the move that God could do right here, just in this community, but not even, think about what he could do around the world. If we stop letting minor issues divide us, and we started being united under the fact that we believe that the word of God is the inerrant word of God. We believe that Jesus is the son of God. We believe that Jesus is the savior of the world. We believe that Jesus is the hope of the world. We believe that Jesus is the only answer. And we started uniting under that, not let these minor issues divide us, but we came together as one united under who Jesus is and what he desires to do in our life. Because the enemy has separated us over minor issues. And it's the greatest tool that he's using right now, today, in the world, to keep the gospel from being spread like wildfire. And so as you walk through the doors, here's what you have to understand. We as a church have to be unified. Passion is this. Passion is knowing and believing the mission that is set in front of us. Like when a team gets together, when you look across professional sports teams, here's the crazy thing. Most teams are not that different in athletic ability. Like they're not. Like you just look across and you can see teams and the athletic ability between each team is very even. What separates teams is this, their unity. Their belief in the mission and the vision of that team. They're all going after that trophy. They all want to win the championship. But here's the thing. Some of them are not accepting the role that they have to play in that team to make that team successful. Heather and I, we've, we have spent so much time this week at basketball games. And so it has been absolutely not. This week alone, we've been at 16 basketball games. Just this week. Yesterday alone, we spent $50 in gate admission fees alone just yesterday. Thank you, Jesus. $50, 16 games. And here's one thing I heard when we were sitting there in one of the games. The coach yelled at one of the players, do your job. That's not your job. That's not your responsibility. You do your job. Why? Because one of the kids decided that what he was supposed to do was not what he wanted to do. And so he decided to do his own thing. And then what ended up happening is he sent everybody else on the court into chaos because he was doing the wrong thing. And then they didn't know what to do because he was not doing what he was supposed to do. He was not doing his responsibility. See, as a church, sometimes what happens with us, what God looks down and what God desires to say is this, do your job. Stop trying to do other things. Stop trying to get distracted. Do your job. Share the gospel. Be the light to the world. Share the hope of Jesus with the people. Just do your job. And if we will unite under what God is calling us to do, and here's who we are as a church. Listen, there is no passion if you are not unified in your pursuit after the same goal. There is no passion if you are not unified in your pursuit 
after the same goal. And so here's what we believe. I believe Jesus is the hope of the world. I believe Jesus is the answer. The answer to what? The answer to everything. I believe Jesus is the answer to answer to my marriage. Yes, absolutely. A- answer to my finances. Yes, absolutely. A- answer to my kids. Yes, absolutely. Jesus is the answer in every situation. I believe this. Jesus changes everything. I believe this. I believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. I believe that the Bible is living and active, meaning this, that what makes the Bible different than any other book? The Bible is not a history book. It does not just thing, speak to things that happened in the past. But the Bible is living and active, meaning this, that when those words were penned, when God spoke to men and they wrote them down on the pages of Scripture, God was thinking of you too. And God knew that there were going to be moments in your life where when you were sitting down and you were reading the Word of God and you were reading, that when you were doing that and you were reading that, God knew that he was specifically going to speak to you through that verse at that time in that day. That's what makes the Bible different than any other book. Is God still speaking to you today, specifically to you? And those words mean something to you. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. I believe that Jesus is the only hope for forgiveness and salvation. I believe that Jesus left you and I a mission, a calling, and a purpose. And I believe that Jesus guides our every step. See, listen, if you and I can unite under those, man, the devil is going to tremble. Because then the mission is this, that we're going to reach Sepulpa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, the state, the nation, and the world. If the church will come together and just say, this is what Scripture says, this is what I know to be true. There may be some minor things that we disagree on. But the major thing of who Jesus is and what he's doing in our life absolutely, totally cannot be compromised. And we stand firm on that. And if you will line up under that, then we will work together and do everything we can to make Jesus famous right here in our community. Because our mission is this. We want Jesus to be famous, not us. We want the name of Jesus to be on every lip. We want the name of Jesus to be confessed as Lord. We want Jesus to be known in every house. And so we do everything we can. And so here's what we want. We want every home to know Jesus. So we unify under that. But the second thing is this. Passion is support. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Think about this. You support what you're passionate about. You support what you're passionate about. Think about a Thunder game. For us as a family, there's six of us in our family. If we go to a Thunder game and we get, let's say we get decent tickets, not even great tickets, decent tickets, we're probably still in the third level. We're having to get binoculars. We're going to spend probably $50 a ticket for our family. That's $300 to go to a Thunder game. Not only that, we're going to pay gas to get down there. And so it's probably going to cost us from here to there and back probably $30 in gas. But then not only that, we're going to look at our kids and we're going to tell them, hey, listen, we're not getting snacks. Don't go to the concession. Like, we're not doing that concession. Stand. We're going to eat before. And we'll eat a nice meal, but we're going to eat before. We're not going to the concession. So don't ask. And so we'll probably go eat dinner and spend another $100. But then we'll get to the game, and right when we walk in, all that food will start calling my kids' names. And my son will look at me and go, Dad, I'm starving. I'm so hungry. I feel like I haven't eaten all day. And I'm like, we literally walked across the street like you just ate a full meal. Dad, I know, but I'm so hungry. I don't know if I can make it. I think I'm going to die, Dad. Like, you're not dying, son. Like, you're good. I got to have food. So then we give in. We're like, okay. Fine, you, you, can, you, you can have, we'll spend another $20 a kid, $60 at the concession stand. And then as they're walking by and they've got their food and their drink and they're happy and everything, they look and the souvenir shop is going, buy, 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 buy. And they're like, I've got to have that. 
And they go in and get a foam finger. And they start waving it and then they set it down and they don't even care about it. They get glasses with the thunder written across that they will never wear again that are $45 each or something. And you end up spending $200 in the gift shop. And then all of a sudden you realize that what you're passionate about costs money. And in a night you've spent $690 to go to a thunder game. But here's the thing, you never regret spending money on what you're passionate about. You don't go home and you don't go, what a terrible day. We had fun watching the game, dinner was great, snacks were great, souvenirs are cool, they're hanging them up in their room and they love it and they got smiles all over their face. No, when you're passionate about it, you don't mind investing in it. When you're passionate about it, you support it. But here's my question to you, and I'm going to push some buttons, and I'm going to make you a little uncomfortable. Why is it we're willing to support everything else we're passionate about, but then when it comes to the house of God, we're so reluctant? Ah, That's good. Two people. (laughs) We'll start there. Why is it that we can be passionate about everything and not have a problem going to a Thunder game and spending that crazy amount of money. But then when it comes to the things of God, we sit there and we're like, ooh, uh uh-uh, I'm not doing that. I would rather go to a Thunder game. Could it be because your passion's in the wrong spot? Could it be because what you're more passionate about is the thunder than you are about your relationship with Jesus? Could it be that you're more passionate about other things and those other things then gain first priority in the way that you support stuff? And so you walk through the door and we act like, oh, I love Jesus. I mean, he is my hope. He is everything to me. Then when the offering bucket goes by, you get really nervous. You're like, <laughs> Why? Why is it? That we're passionate about everything. But then when God just says, hey, I'm, here, here's the thing. God's not even interested in your money. Like God's not sitting in heaven going, I've got a couple streets that need to be finished. And I'm making them out of gold. And so it's going to cost a lot. Like I need you to give as a church. Like we're not, you know, getting this money. And then we have a portal that sends it to heaven so God can f- finish doing what he was doing. Like that's not, God's not interested in your money. God knows this. That what you're passionate about and what you love, you support. And so he's looking at our heart and he's saying, do you truly love me? Because if you truly love me, then your passion will show through that love and you will support. It's uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable. It's awkward in here right now. But here's the thing. Listen, you and I, Like, I'm just going to be honest with you. Building this building is the greatest step of faith Heather and I have ever stepped into in our entire life. I even told the staff the other day, I said, listen, I said, this makes us super nervous. I said, because you have, I've got to be honest with you. We're getting a loan for this. As we get a loan, you have to understand that is the first payment we make every single month. We become slaves to that debt. It's not what we want. It's what we have to do. And I said, so it keeps me up. Heather looked at me the other day, and she was like, you are so distant. She's like, it's not even like you're here. Like, you, for the past couple of weeks, like, you're just, like, you don't want to be around anybody, talk to anybody or anything. I said, I said I'll be honest. I said, this, this whole building thing is making me really nervous. I said, because we need, we need almost 20000 extra dollars a month. And I don't have that. And so we're stepping out in faith. And saying, God, we're doing this because the bottom line, we're out of space. The first service is full. The second service is full. The third service is almost full. We don't have room for new faces and new people. So we have have this dilemma. We can either continue to do what we're doing and be satisfied right now, or we can go after what God has called us to in the future and say, I believe that the future is brighter than the past. I believe what God wants to do in the future is greater than what God's already done. As good as everything is that has happened in the past, man, what God is going to do is blow our mind. But it takes faith. And that faith is scary. Because what you love and what you're passionate about, you support. 
But then the third thing is this. Passion is loyalty. No matter what goes on, no matter what happens, passion is loyalty. You are faithful to your team no matter what. They might have had a great season last year, but now this season, man, it's not looking good. You're still wearing the jersey. Loyalty is putting on your team colors the day after they are absolutely run over by LSU in the playoffs. You still walk out in your colors. Gotcha. Still, so don't talk about my boy. Next year. Next year, come on. Getting a new quarterback, it's going to be good. Second year for a defensive coordinator. Oh, come on. Loyalty is that. Loyalty is when nothing around you is going good, you still stay faithful. Loyalty when it is when it's easy to leave, you stay faithful. Listen, it's easy to walk out the doors when we start talking about support. Ooh, awkward. I just made plans for next Sunday. <laughs> Won't be here. Yeah. I know. Uh, listen. Loyalty sticks with you till the mission is completed. But the next thing is this. Passion is hope. Passion is hope. I'm going to fly through these two. Passion is hope. Hope is this. Hope doesn't tell God about your mountains. Hope tells your mountains about your God. Let me say that again. Hope doesn't tell God about your... God, look at my problems. God, look at what's going on. God, look at, look at how, how much we have to do. God, look at how overwhelming the task in front of us is. God, God look at how, how much we have to come. God, look at every problem. Look at all this stuff. Look at everything that's going on. Look at my mountain. God, help me with that mountain. No, hope is this. Hope is looking at that mountain and going, <laughs> you're fixing to meet my God. My God's fixing to move you. You're fixing to meet my God, and my God is fixing to move you. Listen, hope is knowing that your God is bigger than the mountain that you are facing. Hope is this. Hope is knowing that your future is brighter than your past. Hope is knowing that what is to come is better than what is behind. Hope is knowing that God, what God wants to do in you and through you is greater than what has already been done. Hope is knowing that God is working inside of you. He's working in you so that then He can work through you. Hope is knowing that God may not change your situation. Hope is knowing that God is changing you in the situation. Hope is knowing my situation right here. It may not change. It may not look different tomorrow. But I know that God is working inside of me. And when I get up tomorrow, I know that my situation is going to look different because of what God's doing inside of me. Not because of the situation change, but because God is working inside of me. Hope is a brighter future. Passion is knowing that there is hope for a brighter future. My team may be down right now. We may not be that good, but I promise you next season, oh, come on. I want to see LSU again in the playoffs next year. We will run them over. That's hope. That's hope, but hope is also this. I mean, uh, passion is also this. The last thing, passion is boldness. Acts 4.29 Peter and John had been taken before the council and they stood in front of the council and the council looked at them and they said, we are tired of the name of Jesus. We are tired of you preaching and speaking in the name of Jesus. Do not preach, do not speak in the name of Jesus anymore or you will either be killed or thrown in jail. Those are the only two options. If you speak his name anymore, go back to your house and think about what you did. Peter and John leave. They go back to the church. They stand in front of the church and here's what they say. And now Lord, look upon their threats 
God, you've, you've heard their threats. You know what they're saying. And grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. God, this is what they said, but here's what I need from you. I've got a passion inside of me. I've got something burning. And I know they have said, I mean, they're going to die or be thrown in jail. And so here's what I've got to, God, give me the boldness to continue to speak. And then it says this, and when they prayed, in verse 31, the place in which they gathered together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. When there's a passion in fire, inside of you, and you know there has to be a word that is spoken, the consequences do not matter. Because you know that boldness is caring more about the word you have to speak than the consequences for the word that you are speaking. I care more about this word, and I care more about getting Jesus out than I do what you're going to do to me. When we were sitting at one of the basketball games this week, I had a teacher tap me on the shoulder and she goes, hey, Pastor Johnny, then go to our church. She said, hey, Pastor Johnny, would you pray for me? I said, absolutely. And she said, I might need a job. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I might lose my job. I said, for what? And she was like, well, I got in trouble for talking to my kids about Jesus. And I said, yeah, you got a job. I'll find you a job somewhere. If we can't hire you, I said, somebody will hire you. I said, I promise you, we will not leave you out to dry. Because here's the thing. She knows her paycheck could be on the line. Her job could be on the line. Her future could be on the line. Everything that she has worked to up to this point, her degree, everything that she has done up to this point could be on the line. But she's looking and she's saying, there's something inside of me that's pushing me to say that what the kids need more than anything as I look into their eyes is they need the hope of Jesus. As I stand up in front of them, there's something inside of me saying more than math, more than English, more than history, more than all these things. What they need is they need to know that their future is secure, their eternity is secure because of what Jesus has done. Listen, there's a passion inside of us that says the consequence does not matter when it comes to sharing our faith with Jesus Christ. Some of us have been silent about who Jesus is because we're scared of what the enemy has placed in front of us. Listen, who doesn't want you to speak about God? The enemy. And so we've let the fear of the enemy and what could happen, the consequences. Listen, it could get bad for you. But here's the thing. Here's what I know. There's no regret when you speak truth. You will never regret Speaking the name of Jesus, no matter the consequences that you face. And so here's what I want to encourage you with today. Be passionate. Be passionate. Be passionate for what God's calling you to do. Like if you'll paint your face for your team. Shout the name of Jesus from every rooftop. Listen, what people need, people need Jesus. And my hope to you is this, that when you see me up here every week, that there is a passion inside of me that you look at and you say, that is contagious and I want to leave here and I want some of that fire that's inside of him. And that might not be my personality, but I can be bold. I can be loyal. I can be united, I can be supportive, and I can bring hope. And so that's what I want to do with my passion. Would you pray with me? Listen, as we close the service out today, here, here's the greatest news that you can ever hear. It's that Jesus took your place. The sin that you committed well, it has a cost, and the cost of sin, all sin, one sin or multiple sins, the cost of that sin is death, separation from God for all of eternity. Somebody has to pay that price, and it's either you or Jesus. 
Salvation is recognizing that Jesus loved us so much that he paid that price. That he took what you and I deserve and he made that payment for us. And so here's what I want to encourage you today. If you don't know Jesus, give your heart to him today. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, give your heart to him today. And so with every head bowed, with every eye closed, is there anybody in the room who would say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus today. Would you just put your hand up? Thank you. Who else? Thank you. Who else? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer as a church. As we pray this prayer, I mean, we're going to pray it out loud with you. This prayer does not save you. It's the understanding of what you're praying that saves you. And so what I want you to do is just repeat this prayer after me. The church is going to pray it out loud with you. So just say these words. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus is God's son. I believe that Jesus came to the earth died on the cross, rose from the grave. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me an eternity in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.